I'd like to introduce you to something, and it's actually something that you're already familiar with. It's called the soca beat, and it's essentially uh, <laughs> the rhythm behind what's called calypso music, or Caribbean music. So it goes like this. This music began in Trinidad and Tobago and has spread to the rest of the world since its creation in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, I was trying to think of a more recent example of where you can hear this if you've ever heard Sorry by Justin Bieber, his new song. It's a pretty good example. Now, this rhythm is the result of a shift of a polyrhythm, three over two, meaning that for every three times my left hand claps, my right hand is going to clap twice. So I'll do it once for you. However, if you shift the beats, of my left hand and play them with a little bit of swing, you get something much more rhythmic and interesting. Hence the soca beat. Now at my high school, the director of our music program, Ms. Fennell, opted to have a steel drum ensemble in place of a more traditional ensemble. So my knowledge of calypso or Caribbean music is a little bit more intimate than most. But my knowledge of other not quite as typical musical concepts comes from nothing more than my own curiosity and passion for music, something that I know I share with many people. And so I'm here today to talk about music, but not just, you know, music, not just confusing theory work about threes and twos and polyrhythms and calypso rhythm patterns, but how accessible music is, how ample the resources are to learn about and share music. I know that personally I can consider myself one of the lucky few to have access to such an incredible and unique musical education under the direction of Miss Fennell and the culture that she's created here at Mission Vista. But I am not some savant. I'm not some extraordinary case of musical genius. And for the most part, my musical education began long before I entered any classes at my high school. My real musical journey began over the summer before ninth grade when I was asked by two middle school classmates, uh, there's a better picture of them, uh, to start a band with them. Now, my father was a drummer, and he had always wanted me to be a musician like him. And one of my earliest memories, actually, was receiving on some distant Christmas morning a brand new children's drum set. I was five, and as most of you can probably guess, I was terrible, as most children are at everything. And because I was terrible, I gave up. Now, this exact pattern became my musical mantra over the following years as I tried guitar and piano and drums again and guitar again and piano again as children were encouraged to try everything at least once. And I did that, and more. And while I loved playing music, I hated practicing, as well as performing in front of others. I felt that my teachers were moving too slowly through the basics, and I wanted to be playing my music. And if I wasn't immediately a master of an instrument, I really didn't see any point in continuing to play it. I felt like maybe this musical fantasy I had could never be fulfilled. And this was the mindset I had when my classmates asked me to start a band with them. However, something was different. Maybe it was the prospect of starting life at a new high school where I'd never really met anyone, or maybe some cosmological force was ushering me into some slot, the same slot that I'd been pushed into for years, and the same slot that I'd never been able to accept. And so one day I did, and my dad went out and brought me, bought me a brand new drum set and set about to teach me of the world of percussion. Uh, except that he didn't. Um, instead, he sat down at my new drum kit, he played a basic rock beat, and said, just do that, and the rest will come naturally. I can tell you, after weeks of practicing alone in my garage, that it did not come naturally. <laughs> slowly, but surely, but very slowly, I grasped the basics, and eventually joined my friends for rehearsals, which led to eventually playing small local shows, which led to eventually playing at the House of Blues two summers later. But before we got that far, in fact, before we even played at any of the small local coffee shops, I found myself faced with a bit of creative boredom. See, it wasn't that I didn't love playing the drums. It just, it wasn't practical. You know, it's not an instrument you can carry around with you everywhere you go. And I wanted to be playing music all the time, everywhere I went. I felt that it hadn't been too challenging to teach myself how to play the drums, and so it couldn't be too difficult to teach myself how to play another instrument. I asked my friend, the lead guitarist, again, uh, to teach me a song on guitar, and he taught me The Suburbs by Arcade Fire. It's a great song, and I sucked. And I didn't <laughs> stop playing and sucking everywhere I went for about two months. I played every guitar I could get my hands on, the same clumsy four chords over and over again, until I could switch between them with relative ease. And by this point, my friends hated me, but I felt this foreign sense of pride. I moved on to simple chords, and with those chords, I learned to play more simple songs, 
Then I moved to bar chords. Then finally I got my own guitar for Christmas, which I later smashed, and let me tell you, that's one of the most satisfying things you can ever do. <laughs> and now, after having played with two bands in front of over a thousand people as both a lead and rhythm guitarist, I can confidently say that I am moderately adept at guitar. <laughs> An advanced amateur, one might say. Over the following summer, I again felt stale with the instruments I could play and found myself watching YouTube covers of piano songs and mimicking those finger motions on my friends' pianos. The first song I ever learned, actually, was I Can't Make You Love Me by Bonnie Raitt. It's a good song. By the time I was a junior, I had played drums for two different bands, guitar for two, as well as write upwards of 50 songs for guitar and piano, including a score for a movie that has admittedly yet to be made, but it's coming, and <laughs> produced an album of seven songs that I co-wrote with my then-girlfriend. Ooh, this is important. It's free, so go check it out and download it. Uh, this, this fall, I will be attending San Francisco State University as a music major, something that I had never thought possible, even just three years ago. I'm not trying to brag. <laughs> Really, I'm not, because there's really nothing that I just mentioned worth bragging about. I'm not exceptional. I'm not this musical prodigy. I was always terrible. The only thing that saved me was my inability to give up. I wanted to play music so badly, and then once that had been fulfilled, I wanted to be playing music as much as I could everywhere I went, so I taught myself more. And the point behind all this is that no matter what anyone may tell you, and no matter what you may think, you can play an instrument. And I know you can, because I can. <laughs> However, if you seem to think that I am some sort of fluke born with this innate talent, I'm going to tell you that I took this very same message that I'm delivering to all of you right now to my friends. And all of the friends that I had in middle school, friends I still have contact with today, picked up an instrument when encouraged, and after being taught the suburbs by Arcade Fire, learned more songs and went on to compose music as well. In fact, two of my friends went and joined their school's music composition programs as soon as they could, and are now releasing their own music on SoundCloud. Just this, it got so bad that whenever we would hang out, there would be fights over who got to play the guitar. And this is all from people who have never received any formal musical training whatsoever. Just this last summer, I taught my best friend how to play Lean On Me on piano. And then two weeks later, she comes to me and tells me she taught herself how to play three more songs just by looking them up online. So I'm trying to tell you that there is nothing limiting your ability to play an instrument except your inability to believe in yourself. And if that's what's been holding you back for so long, from becoming a part of such a significant aspect of our culture, let me do it for you. I'm telling you right now that I believe in every single one of you, that I've never met someone who could not play an instrument, and that I stand by the statement that music is more accessible now than ever. And to not take advantage of this fact is an affront to yourself. I know that it's April, and it's a little late to start a New Year's resolution, um, but please don't let the time of year stop you from picking up a skill that will, and I can promise you this it will bring you enjoyment for the rest of your life. Now, some of you may be having trouble connecting this, wow, I feel so motivated to play an instrument now with, um, why, why should I do that? Why should I care about that? Well, I think inherently, we have a desire to create. All of us, we do. But you can't really create unless you have the skills and the tool set to do so. So I'm urging you to go out and create that tool set for yourself. Gather those skills, because we need to create. I feel in popular music there are inadequacies that need to be addressed, and we can be the generation that, stop, that puts an end to these inadequacies and puts an end to music being made for profit. Now, I want to ask you a question, and it's one that doesn't have a specific answer, really. Uh, different people are going to have different answers for different reasons. So the question is this. What makes music powerful? And it's important to try and define it, because if we lose sight of this question, then we're not going to be providing an answer. And if we're not answering this question, our music will become stale and dull, no longer emotive and impassioned. It will lose significance, but more importantly, it will lose credibility, because its effectiveness as an art form will be weakened if it doesn't lend meaning to emotion or give a voice to feelings inside of us that we can't describe. So look no further than the four chord song. Oh. I'm going to play some music for you really quickly. I hope you don't mind. And I want you to see. Oh, thank you. I want you to see if you can recognize any of it. Is that loud enough? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. She took the No more, it cannot wait. I'm your 
same progression or order, as do countless other hit songs for the past four decades, and stretching back before that even to uh, Paco Bell's Canon in D, uh, which is a... <laughs> and I'm not trying to diminish the value of these songs or label them as inferior. Uh, these songs are mega popular hits that clearly a majority of the population connected with and still connect with today. So who am I to say that songs using this little trick are somehow lesser when people clearly feel something very real when they listen to them. Well, I am saying it, um, and it's an argument that's slightly controversial. So if I'm labeled as some sort of music snob, then so be it. When we listen to these songs that share the same four chords, our emotions are reduced to their base value, happy, sad, or angry, whatever it may be. These chords don't display any other kind of emotion except for slight tension and slight resolution. But instead of slight tension and slight resolution being used for any specific purpose, the tension is merely resolved every four bars to provide some short-lived burst of happiness. See, the right cadence, like moving from a four chord back to the tonic or the one chord, is actually scientifically shown to release dopamine in the brain. So these songs are chemically designed to make us feel happy and want to listen to them. But for a song to truly, I'm sorry, <laughs> music has the incredible ability to provide an outlet for our emotions. It can lend a voice to feelings inside of us that we may not have been aware of or been able to describe. But these four chord songs don't contain these abstract emotions. They contain basic emotions that anyone can relate to at any moment in their life, which is why they're so popular. But in order for a song to truly affect someone and make a difference in their life, it must be able to at once communicate the subtleties in an emotion or experience and then make it simple to relate to. The four chord songs are merely simple to relate to and only one of many musical shortcuts that artists use to make a song into a hit. Because it's hard to write a song, you know. It, anyone who's tried understands that it's a lot more difficult than it may seem. And it's no secret that artists steal ideas all the time. Uh, the Beatles copied the Beach Boys, who copied the Safaris, who copied Dick Dale, and on and on and on and on and on. But stealing ideas is important. Stealing intellectual property is lazy. This is Bruno Mars' hit song, Treasure. <laughs> and this is a song released two years earlier by an artist named Breakbot called Baby I'm Yours. I'm sure you've all heard about Marvin Gaye's family suing Robin Thicke for taking blurred lines and making it a direct copy of Got to Give It Up, but here are the two songs just in case you haven't. resources to, to access this knowledge that has been given to us. And with that, we can create music with more artistic merit, with original ideas. There are limitless, literally limitless possibilities for chord combinations and melodies and rhythms and form. It seems almost counterintuitive to hear the same four chords over and over and over again, or hear a hit song being replicated 40 years later, or even just two years later. The soca beat 
is the most danceable rhythm in the world. That's why it's found across cultures. So why is popular dance music characterized by a basic four on the floor beat that oomps, 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 oomps you hear on TV? There's a lack of innovation in popular music, and it stems from a lack of inertia. This is not a challenge to the major pop stars of our day, or the people who write their songs for them, or the people who connect with this music, because I connect with this music. I love all these songs, really, I do. But it's important to ask ourselves about the power behind this music. Is it powerful? How powerful? And can we create something better? My answer is yes. My answer is that we have these resources at our disposal, and with those resources, we can use that to create something better. We have thousands of online tools. We have Spotify to discover exciting new bands, and GarageBand, and MIDI synthesizers that make it easier than ever to create and compose music, and then share that music through websites like SoundCloud and Bandcamp. The internet age is here, and it's time to start putting it to use. We're at the frontier of something. We know more about music than we ever have before, and we all share this wider definition of music thanks to pioneers like Debussy and Schoenberg. And we have more resources to access the knowledge that they've given us and put it to uses that they would have never thought possible. We can step into something great, and it won't take much more than a simple push towards ambition. Take advantage of the opportunities that are all around us, and not just in music. The cooking classes are online and simple and free, uh, just two weeks ago, I Googled how to start my own pirate radio station, and it'll cost less than $100. <laughs> MIT has all of their courses available online for free. That's the link. You can Google it, as do countless other prestigious colleges. As the world changes, so does the accessibility to culture. And more than ever before, we can, we can jump in and begin learning with minimal effort. It just takes initiative. Please take that initiative. Finally, to synthesize all this, I want to show you a song by a well-known electronic composer who goes by the name Aphex Twin. Uh, his most famous song is called Avril 14, and it's a piece for piano, which is an instrument that he himself does not actually play. So he programmed a computer to play the notes through a MIDI interface, meaning he plugged in the note values and the lengths, and he plugged that computer into a machine called a disc clavier, which is essentially just a self-playing piano that can be programmed through a computer. So this is Avril 14. Played entirely by a computer, but only possible through human endeavor. And of course, not a year later, stolen and used by Kanye West for his 2011 album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Because it's easy to be lazy. I urge everyone listening to tame that urge and create something better. Thank you.